Big League Baseball stardom to a prison cell. Ex-major leaguer Chad Curtis will likely spend years behind bars after being found guilty of fondling teen athletes that he was supposed to be training. August 16th, 2013 in Michigan, former American professional baseball outfielder Chad Curtis stands before a judge in the Barry County Circuit Court. Curtis, a well-respected athlete, is standing trial for six counts of criminal sexual conduct ranging from misdemeanors to felonies, carrying a potential 15-year sentence. Chad Curtis is in the Barry County Jail tonight. He's going to be back here on September 26th to be sentenced. He could get 15 years in prison for molesting those girls. The former New York Yankees player, who was in August 2012, ordered to stand trial after several female students accused him of inappropriately touching them is the most unlikely of suspects. The jury found him guilty of six counts of criminal sexual conduct involving three female students at Lakewood High School. Curtis views himself as a Bible-believing Christian and claims that he never drank alcohol, never committed adultery, and never used curse language. During his time as a player, he often chastised teammates for missing chapel, listening to explicit rap, and even watching the Jerry Springer show, which he believed was immoral. The question now becomes, could Curtis be guilty of the things he preached against? This is the twisted case of Chad Curtis. Born on November 6, 1968 in Marion, Indiana, Chad Curtis was raised in Middleville, Michigan and Benson, Arizona. His background contributed to his love for baseball as his parents gave him the necessary support early enough. He attended Benson High School where he played baseball and varsity football but was kicked off the baseball team for being too fiery and often getting involved in fights. He then attended Grand Canyon University, Cochise College, and Yavapai College, playing baseball at all three colleges. Curtis's love for baseball was like that of an ant in sugar. He was always on the lookout for an opportunity to do what he believed he knew how to do best. This was visible in his passion and desire to join the school team in every college he attended, and as a testament to his talent, he always managed to break into the team, although his temper often got the best of him. Though the young and elegant Chad Curtis developed a passion for baseball from a tender age, he only began his professional career in baseball in 1989. He made his first official appearance in 1992 at the Major League Baseball Draft with the California Angels when the 1,155th player was chosen. Following his skills and experience, after making his Major League debut in 1992, he played in 139 games at all three outfield positions in his team, Major League Baseball. While in the American League Division Series, as a shining light that cannot be hidden, he was a delight to his team at all times. In the 1998 League Championship Series, he was 0 for 4 with a walk and a strikeout. He, however, did not play in the 1998 World Series. Curtis played all four games of the 1999 World Series in left field. He is best known for hitting a walk-off home run in Game 3 of the series against the Atlanta Braves. It was his second home run of the game. Following the home run, NBC sportscaster Jim Gray sought to conduct an on-field interview with Curtis. Weirdly, Curtis refused to talk with him. He indicated that this was in response to Gray's earlier pointed interview on gambling with Pete Rose, a former baseball player who had been banned from involvement with MLB because of his gambling history. Curtis told Gray, I can't do it. As a team, we kind of decided because of what happened with Pete, we're not going to talk out here on the field. Uh, I, I can't do it. You know, as a team, we kind of decided that, you know, we, because uh, of what happened with Pete, we're, we're not going to talk out here on the field. But then Yankees manager Joe Tor later said there was no such unified effort to snub Gray from either Yankees players or front office staff, and that Curtis had acted alone. During Curtis's playing time in New York, he was known for getting aggressive at any given opportunity the same behavior he displayed while he was in college. He preferred to hit fellow players on the field and stepped on anyone's toe to hit a target he set for himself. He publicly scolded his teammate Derek Jeter in front of teammates and reporters near the dugout and at Jeter's locker in the clubhouse because Jeter was fraternizing with the Seattle Mariners shortstop Alex Rodriguez during an on-field fracas between the two teams. Curtis told Jeter that he did not know how to play the game. He also persistently solicited Jeter to attend chapel after Jeter had already declined. Curtis said, if I have something that I believe is the truth and is necessary for other people to come to some type of recognition or grip of that truth, then I want to share it. With growing frustration among his teammates, Curtis was transferred to the Texas Rangers. On December 13, 1999, the Yankees traded him to the Texas Rangers for pitchers Brandon Knight and Sam Marcinek. A Yankee official later revealed the reason behind Curtis's sudden transfer. 
Chad just couldn't stay around any longer because that act gets tiring. Once he became comfortable here, he became a preacher and it ran its course. This metamorphosed into his career with the Texas Rangers between 2000 and 2001. During the 2000 season, Curtis became the first right-handed batter to hit a home run into the upper deck in right field at Rangers Ballpark in Arlington. He played in 108 games that year, hitting 272 with 8 home runs and 48 runs batted in. He was second in the American League among left fielders and errors with 5. That season, his salary was $2 million. The rise in his income was of course merited because he was perpetually working hard and improving daily, which showed in his performances on the pitch. Curtis was a good player, no doubt, but his pitfall was his issue with anger and him being easily offended. In April 2000, Curtis had a heated confrontation in the clubhouse weight room with teammate Royce Clayton that nearly came to blows after Curtis insisted on turning off rap music that Clayton was playing, whose lyrics Curtis objected to. He also turned off a television show in the clubhouse that he disapproved of his teammates watching. During that season, he told his Jewish teammate outfielder Gabe Kapler that Kapler was going to hell if he didn't believe that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior. His action clearly spoke volumes of his religiosity. Curtis was also unable to respect his teammates' boundaries, always enforcing his religion on his teammates. In 2001, while with the Texas Rangers, he hit 252 with 3 home runs and 10 runs batted in just 38 games. That season, he earned $1.9 million. On November 5, 2001, Curtis was granted free agency. This led to his retirement from professional baseball after the 2001 season. Chad Curtis played Major League Baseball from 1992 to 2001 for the California Angels, Detroit Tigers, Los Angeles Dodgers, Cleveland Indians, New York Yankees, and Texas Rangers, compiling a 264 career batting average and hitting 101 home runs. Curtis earned a name as one of the committed players of his time. Following his retirement from Major League Baseball MLB, Curtis earned a teaching certificate at the Evangelical Cornerstone University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He then worked for two years as a physical education teacher and coach at Caledonia High School outside of Grand Rapids. His teaching career began in Evangelical Cornerstone University, although it was unfortunately cut short following allegations of his involvement in sexually assaulting female teenage students. One young lady said Curtis touched her thigh and groin area under the guise of physical therapy. With all the controversy, he left Evangelical Cornerstone University in 2006 and was employed as the athletic director and weight training instructor at North Point Christian High School, a fundamentalist Baptist school in Grand Rapids. While at the school, he was in charge of the construction of the school's weight room. His bad luck seemed to linger on as he was fired without public explanation in 2009. The reason behind Curtis losing his job at the North Point Christian High School remains unknown to date. But that did not end his teaching career as he proceeded to another institution. At the dawn of the 2010-2011 school year, Curtis began substitute teaching and volunteering in the Lakewood Public Schools, Lake Odessa, Michigan weight room. Along with coaching youth baseball, in 2011, Curtis coached the Lakewood Public Schools equestrian team, which included two of his daughters. The team won State Division D championship honors that same year. He combined it with working as a substitute teacher, high school weight training coach, and head coach of the high school varsity football team. Curtis's stay at Lakewood Public Schools was felt by all. His experience as a trained sportsman, ever resilient, and can-do spirit was instrumental to the success of the school in the area of sports. This was evident in his contribution and leadership, which led to the school winning in most tournaments. However, he became the talk of all following his involvement in sexual assault with female teenage students. In May 2012, after several female students accused Curtis of inappropriately touching them, he resigned from his positions at Lakewood Public Schools. In June, a month after the accusation, Curtis was ordered to stand trial for five counts of criminal sexual conduct, ranging from misdemeanors to felonies carrying a potential 15-year sentence. These are horrible cases. That's just the way it is. They're horrible. But what I have to do is go overboard with caution until we have a conclusion. Curtis will now go to trial on five counts of criminal sexual conduct. But this was only the beginning of Chad Curtis's woes. In August of the same year, Curtis was charged with an additional sixth count of criminal sexual conduct. Between the period of three months, more female teenage students were queuing up filing cases of being sexually assaulted by the former baseball player. Chad Curtis was smeared in a scandal that was snowballing really fast. 
Curtis's criminal trial began on August 12, 2013, and by August 2013, three of his victims and two others, all underage girls, testified and affirmed Curtis's involvement in the case. Chad Curtis was in court today in an effort to fend off a multi-million dollar lawsuit against him. The suit brought on by teen victims that he sexually assaulted while volunteering at Lakewood High. According to their testimony, Curtis offered massages to some of the female athletes at the school, but not to any of the boys. As far as, uh, did you seem to have a good relationship with Mr. Curtis? Yes. Did you ever see anything inappropriate between them? No. Although at this point Curtis hadn't been proven guilty of the allegations, things weren't exactly looking too good for him as more revelations came to the limelight. Another accusation surfaced that Curtis molested two 15-year-old girls in 2012 when he was a volunteer weight room strength trainer at Lakewood High School in Lake Odessa, Michigan. Subsequently, he was also accused of sexually assaulting a 16-year-old girl in 2011. His sexual assault case was gathering momentum as issues were unraveling daily. Interestingly, it was reported that Curtis told his 2011 victim that his conduct toward her was the most unfaithful he had ever been to his wife. He gave the massages first in the school's weight room, then in a room next to the weight room, and ultimately in a windowless trainer's room. On August 16th, Curtis was found guilty on all six counts, including third-degree criminal sexual conduct, a crime that involves sexual penetration. In an hour-long address to the court, Curtis accused all his victims of lying. He claimed that they made unwelcome sexual advances to him. Julie Knockfor Pratt, who prosecuted Curtis at Barry County, Michigan, declared that Curtis's sentencing statement was the most selfish, self-serving, victim-blaming statement she had heard in her career as a prosecutor. The prosecution also added that his statement speaks volumes about his character, or lack thereof, in line with the crime he's guilty of. On October 3, 2013, Chad Curtis was sentenced by Barry County Circuit Court Judge Amy McDowell to 7 to 15 years in prison. The judge sentenced Curtis to the max of between 7 and 15 years in prison, irritated more than swayed, she seemed, by Curtis's long soliloquy. In a similar charge in February 2015, Curtis's criminal convictions were upheld by the Michigan State Appeals Court in a 3-0 decision. After pursuing an attempt in March 2016 for resentencing, Curtis later withdrew the request when the presiding judge signaled that Curtis faced the possibility of a longer term of incarceration. After his conviction, his former teammate Gabe Kapler wrote, I'm floored that I misjudged the character of a man so horribly. Perhaps I was blinded by the mantle of righteous moral authority he always tried to wear and never looked deeper. Chad Curtis wasn't the first major leaguer to commit a heinous crime. I'm confident in my assessment, however, that he'll represent the last time that I allow the veil of religion and perceived moral high ground to impede my better judgment of another human being's fiber. Curtis was incarcerated at the Gus Harrison Correctional Facility in Adrian, Michigan. He was paroled on September 22, 2020 and placed on supervision for the next two years. He also had a 2014 federal civil lawsuit filed against him by three of the victims in the criminal sexual conduct case and by a fourth Lakewood High School student accuser with similar claims. Curtis was found liable for battery against all four girls. A former Lakewood Public Schools board member who had started a group ministry with Curtis, Brian Potter, revealed for the first time in a 2015 deposition that Curtis had admitted to him in May 2012 that he had kissed one of the victims inappropriately. Potter had not reported the conversation to authorities. In June 2017, Curtis's victims settled a civil lawsuit against Lakewood Public Schools for $575,000. In September 2017, Curtis entered into a settlement with three of his four victims. The fourth victim took Curtis to trial. In October 2017, she was awarded a $1.8 million judgment against Curtis. Curtis's ordeal would have been independent of his ex-wife, Candace Curtis, until she was in May 2018 mentioned by a federal lawsuit filed by one of his victims, claiming that Curtis transferred nearly all his money and assets to his ex-wife, Candace Curtis, in an effort to avoid court-ordered payouts to his victims. This was further made believed following Candace's and Curtis's conversations that were uncovered by the court investigation team. Citing recorded telephone conversations between Chad and Candace Curtis, the plaintiff's attorney Monica Beck said, they, Curtis and his ex-wife, transferred lots of money, vehicles, houses, and disposed and liquidated a lot of their assets, which they then tried to hide from the state of Michigan and then tried to hide from our client. Beck also cited a statement by Candace Curtis during one of those telephone conversations, 
I'm trying to keep things out of the victim's hands. I'm not trying to get everything. I don't want to get anything. But I don't, I don't feel like I need everything or I'm even entitled to everything. But I don't want that witch to get any of it either. So where, where do I come into the equation? In January 2019, Candace Curtis lost a bankruptcy petition with the judge writing that Candace Curtis was simply attempting to forestall, if not escape, the post-judgment collection proceedings in district court. And her testimony is indicative of her lack of good faith. To further justify the victim's claims that Curtis indeed transferred his assets to his ex-wife, the chief prosecutor at Barry County recounted his several cases of sexually assaulting female students during his time with Lakewood Public Schools. Chad Curtis, a former Detroit Tiger and New York Yankee, has relinquished all plans to become the Lakewood High School varsity football coach. He told Monica Beck that Curtis was being investigated for inappropriate touching and sexually assaulting female students. He painted the picture that Curtis was suspended from duties as a weight room supervisor on April 27, 2010, when school officials were notified by an Ionia County Sheriff's detective of the investigation. Amidst the heavy allegations, the imprisoned former big leaguer Chad Curtis still believed he could break down the testimony of student athletes who accused him of sexual assault. He said in court documents that they would not be able to fabricate their stories if he questioned them personally. The United States Magistrate Judge Ellen Carmody rejected the pleading. She said any court documents have to be filed by attorneys he fired, the attorneys she forced to continue representing Curtis. The judge ordered Warner Norcross and Judd to represent Curtis at least through depositions and early stages of the $4 million lawsuit filed by current or former Lakewood High School students. Curtis has told his attorneys he will no longer pay them and wants to represent himself. In a short order filed Monday, December 1st, 2013, Carmody wrote, Chad Curtis is represented by counsel. All filings should be submitted to this court through Chad Curtis's counsel. Curtis, having been accused of sexually assaulting three student athletes under the guise of giving therapeutic massages while he worked as a weight training coach at Lakewood, was later convicted in Gus Harrison Correctional Facility in Adrian. The three, along with another girl who testified at trial, sued Curtis. Barry County District Judge Michael Shipper wouldn't let our cameras in the courtroom while two teenage girls explained what happened in a locked weight room at school with no windows. The girls said Curtis was helping them with their injuries through massage therapy. He at some point, Mr. Curtis, pulls up her sports bra, exposing her breasts and rubs her breasts. Curtis asked the judge to allow him to leave Gus Harrison Correctional Facility to depose the four plaintiffs next month. I very much want to defend myself in this action, Curtis wrote. Count two against me states defendant Curtis's characterization of plaintiffs as liars who filed false reports against him was intentional. The question is whether or not they did lie. My opportunity to question the witnesses in a kind, courteous, and compassionate way may bring about the dismissal of this case, saving the court valuable time and resources. She said the attorney for the school district, which is also being sued, may not be interested in questioning the plaintiffs about the truth of their encounters with Curtis. Even if it was, no lawyer knows the history of my interactions with these plaintiffs, including the details of the alleged assaults where no one else was present. Only I and the plaintiffs have that knowledge. There are far too many facts and details in dispute for me to list them all. Chad Curtis, a Christian, a Bible-carrying believer who always viewed himself and claimed that he never took alcohol, committed adultery, or any other sin. During his time as a player, he often chastised his teammates for missing chapel, listening to explicit tape and videos, and even watching the Jerry Springer show, which he believed was immoral and would take them to hell. Such action was one that anyone could take an oath for, that he cannot perpetuate such an act he was found guilty of. No one is above temptation or being led by evil. This has been a question that no one could truly provide an accurate answer to. But whatever may have pushed him, of course, he learned his lesson in his twisted case serves as a detriment to other men out there. All of his attempts to deny the six charges leveled against him proved abortive as he was sent to Gus Harrison Correctional Facility in Adrian, Michigan, having been found guilty of all. He did not agree to be guilty of any of the allegations of missed evidence, but we cannot tell if he had an iota of truth in all his statements. Chad Curtis learned his lesson at the Barry County Jail. It attested to the fact that he who has control over himself before a woman's thigh has solved half of his problems. Thank you very much for sticking to the end of this video. We want to believe you've had a nice time watching it. Let us know what you think about the crimes of Chad Curtis. 
Please keep the conversation going by sharing your thoughts with us in the comment section. Don't forget to click the red button on your screen to subscribe to this channel for more interesting videos like this from us. See you in our next video.